Hey everyone, with a story as huge and important as the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it's hard to know the right level of analysis. So in this conversation with Gary Lackman, we're looking at how the religious and philosophical history of Russia is influencing the present, and especially Vladimir Putin. They have a mystical vision of Russia. It's not a country, it's not a nation. It's, 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 a, it's a kind of unity. It's like an organic entity that stretches across the great continent. And Ilyin had a kind of, he's called the Russian fascist in some way, because he did have this, again, this theocratic view of, of the church and the state coming together. And everyone would find their right place within that organic unity. And, you know, the, the elite up on the top level would, you know, shoulder the burden of shepherding everyone and making sure they're all happy and part of one big kind of family. So this is the sort of traditional values kind of vision that, that Putin talks about. I've also pulled together a written document with some good links to the best analysis and writing and also some good people to follow on Twitter for an up-to-date account of what's going on. So register for our newsletter on Substack, the link is below in the show notes, to get access to this and also to see all of the other written pieces that we put out. And I hope you find this conversation useful. Gary, welcome back. Good to see you again, David. So you've been on Rebel Wisdom before. You've got a real keen interest in the esoteric, in the sort of the, the deeper streams of thought that maybe aren't reflected in a lot of the, the kind of news agenda. And with Russia in particular at the moment, I was really thinking about like, what is a lens? What is an angle that there's so much coverage of it at the moment on the, on the media, obviously. So it's like, what could be a different way of looking at it, a, a sort of deeper understanding of what's going on. And you wrote this book a couple of years ago, the Return of Holy Russia, Apocalyptic History, Mystical Awakening, and the Struggle for the Soul of the World. Are you quite pleased with that title in retrospect? Uh, well, the title's mine, the subtitle uh, was the publisher's, but it seems to have been apt uh, a certain degree. I, and I, not that I would have wanted it to be so, but uh, said that the apocalyptic uh, kind of resonance is suddenly, you know, flapping on the news a bit here. Um, but one thing I found uh, during the research for that book uh, I never thought I'd wind up doing a history of Russia, but that's, that's pretty much what it is from a kind of mystical, esoteric angle, is that there is this apocalyptic strain um, in the Russian psyche. Uh, no need to be alarmist, but uh, even many Russians themselves uh, have said this. There's a kind of all or nothing. Uh, they're, they're, they're not, uh, they don't do the middle ground very well. They're uh, people of extremes. And uh, if you look at their history, you'll see there it's it's punctuated with you know uh, localized uh, sort of apocalyptic events. Mm. And maybe let's start by like summarizing what the the theme of the book is, because I think like one of the one of the big um, overarching lenses that Rebel Wisdom is formed around is that we're in post secular times, and we have to understand sort of some of the deeper religious currents that are playing out behind the kind of the news agenda and the kind of geopolitical questions and with with Russia in particular and especially reading your work there is this sense that there is a religious vision there is a a sense of yeah a sense of like in a way you could almost sort, sort of see this as would you go as far as to say that this is kind of a religious war from from the kind of Russian perspective mm. well at first of all, I would say I think we're going to post everything time, post-secular, post, post just about everything. Uh, every, everything you knew until now was wrong, uh, sort of, um, where we are. So, But no, no, certainly, again, one of the other things you find if you, if you study up on Russia, Russian history, is that it, it is religious through and through. Russia, as we understand it, or the Russian people, as we understand them, started more or less uh, sort of the mid, uh, mid to late 10th century. In Kiev in Ukraine, um, and this was a period that was known as Kievan Rus, and the Rus were the people, and Kiev was one of the cities that were founded, and there were others, Novgorod and other cities at the time, and this was originally Vikings coming down um, into the uh, Ukraine basin, uh, first raiding, <laughs> then being asked to stay and kind of be the policeman. Uh, and then blending and becoming, you know, the Russian people, a mix of the Slav and the Viking. Um, but um, no, it goes back then. And then in around 989, 988, around then, um, Vladimir I, uh, a statue to whom um, 
Vladimir today, Tsar Vladimir Putin today, uh, erected a few years back just outside the Kremlin, uh, and it echoes or is one very much like that's in the center of Kiev itself. Um, he converted to Greek Orthodox Christianity, and that's and that unified. Um, he banned the pagan religion and went about erecting churches and so on and so on and converting all the people. So that's when it became kind of Russia. And they took on the Greek Orthodox, which later became Russian Orthodox, and on Christianity, sort of lock, stock, and barrel. It was um, uh, a belief, a faith that was ready-made for them just to grab hold on to. And it itself has more interest in the end times than the Roman uh, Catholicism. I mean, that gives lip service, uh, you know, you know, uh, repent, ye sinner, for the end is nigh. But in the Greek Orthodox and later Russian Orthodox, that's something that's actually very much uh, a central part of it. Yeah, and I mean, the big question, so of having read your book and you make this very sort of coherent argument about the kind of religious sensibility that drives all, and its sort of coherent worldview that's very influential in Russia, the question that I have is how widespread is that? Because if you look at if you look at kind of what's going on at the moment with Ukraine, Ukraine seems to be fighting like it's it's not been as one sided mm. as you might have expected, given mm. Russia's dominance. Ukraine's fighting back. They've obviously got their own worldview as well about freedom and independence, and they seem to be kind of that seems mm. to be obviously hugely animating for Ukraine as well. So the question I have, I guess, is it certainly seems that this is very influential on Putin and the people around him. Is it that animating for the ordinary Russian? Is it that animating for, say, the conscripts who are kind of, because religious narratives are incredibly powerful, mm. like they, they drive people forward. But the question, certainly how it seems at the moment, and we're only a few days into the war, but it certainly seems that A, Ukraine is fighting back a lot harder than mm. maybe mm. a lot of people expected. And if there is this sort of animating religious worldview mm. for the Russians, it doesn't seem that animating to mm. the people mm. on the mm. on the ground floor. Oh, well, I mean, I. I, I have no idea what the so-called average Russian, if there is one, you know, mm. thinks about this. Um, it's it's the kind of story that uh, they've been told, mm. and I mean, you remember, you know, Russia went into free fall, you know, in the '90s. It was complete chaos, and that's this is the this is the, the madness out of which uh, Putin arose to pull it all together. Again, that's. <laughs> That's, that's a tradition in Russian history. That you, it, it collapses into these times of chaos and, and just uh, utter anarchy. And there's a strong figure who comes and gathers the people together. And so, again, you know, of course, there's people, there's many on, uh, as we know, Navalny and, and, and many other critics of Putin. And there's many um, people who want to be not Westerners, but, you know, more sided with that. Obviously, Ukraine's an example of that. Again, that starts up in um, you know, at the time of Peter the Great, you know, the attempt to Westernize Russia. Uh, so it isn't a backward cousin, the rest of Europe. But then you had movements within Russia, the Slavophiles. Uh, who no? We, we're 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 Russian. We're Slavs. You know, we go back to the the Mongols, the people of the steppes. This is another kind of um, gesture that Dugan makes, and Putin does as well. I mean, that used to be considered in Russian history this horrible period. You know, un, under the Mongol yoke, but then subsequent, say, I don't know, subsequent to sort of Perestroika and and all that, uh, there was work of this maverick historian uh, Lev Gumilev who he said, no, 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 we, we need to go back and embrace that, that Mongol uh, inheritance, that, that we, we are part of that. And that, that leads, this is, you know, it's not, it's not Western, it's not, you know, democratic, it's not liberal, it's not uh, rational, it's not that, it's something much more mythic and, you know, uh, again, it's, it's all these strange, I mean, Russia has, they have, they have their own science. I mean, how the people... I don't know. I'm not on the ground talking to them. I'm sure many of them think it's all just a line. But if you look at Trump, I mean, in a similar way, Trump sort of activated a kind of religious sensibility uh, in America. That, too, is back to a golden age, 1950s Americana, you know, sort of Eisenhower years or something like that. Um, MAGA is a kind of, you know, religious cult. And so he, he and many, many people did, you know, you know, we... You, at least we could see evidence of it, you know, um, on the television and all that. And <laughs> barbarians stormed uh, the capital and all that. So I suspect there are people in Russia who, 
I should say, embrace this or accept this idea because they were in free fall, had an identity crisis for the longest time. And so one of the things Putin's done is actually given them a sense of identity. And one of the things he's done in recent years is return to this notion of holy Russia um, uh, in order to do that. I mean, the, the, the book is, the inspiration for the book was, or the reason I, I, I wrote the book is I had a lot of material left over from doing Dark Star Rising. But then I came across this um, article about Putin giving his regional governors a reading list um, of books to read. And they were uh, Russian philosophers on them, two, two of whom I, uh, whose work I knew, Vladimir Soloviev and Nikolai Berdyaev, and the third I didn't know, Ivan Ilyin, and he's the one who's the most um, influential. And he's much more political thinker than either of those two. Um, but I thought it was interesting that he was giving his regional governors, you know, philosophers to read. And I, 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 you know, what would have Trump uh, had suggested, aside from one of his own books, probably. Um, but then the response. Uh, David Could you was, summarize their, their philosophy? Slovia was a mystical philosopher. Um, he, he had a vision of Russia being able to embody like the true Christianity. And there was a notion of Russian universalism. That, 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 uh, that's another aspect of Russian culture is where they seem to absorb things from other cultures and turn them into something different. It still recognizably comes from the source, but it has a peculiar own character to it. And that somehow um, is able to reach out to all people. So there's a, there's a sense in which the Russian is able to somehow um, embody or symbolize like all peoples, all cultures. And Soloviev did have, did have a vision in the late 19th century of a kind of revived uh, Christendom coming out of sort of Russia and being able to unite the different religions. And, and, and uh, he actually did have some political ideas, but he realized they would not been, be able to put into practice. So it was more of a spiritual kind of vision. Um, but Dyer is a strange character. Uh, he started out as a Marxist, uh, and then he rejected Marx. And um, he was another deeply religious uh, sensibility to which he wedded a, a, a radical existentialism based on the notion of freedom. He's sort of a, a kind of he's a sort of aristocratic anarchist in the sense that is very much about the individual's freedom and all that. And, th and th again, that's a that's a very much a religious idea. We think about freedom. We, th we usually think of it in terms of political terms, of secular. Uh, but it's actually, when you get down to it, you know, the kind of freedom Berdai was talking about is the kind that was explored in, say, uh, Dostoevsky's novels, where you're faced with this kind of radical absolute freedom, and what do you, what do, you do with it? And that, that's, that's a religious question, because no, no political program, no social program, no economic program, all those things may enable you to actually spend your time confronting that question, but they can't answer it for you. And that's... That's the religious kind of thing. And those kind of questions obsessed Berdyaev and they obsessed um, m many Russian figures. That's why when like Russian literature like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy came to the West, it bowled people over. You have Flaubert, the great artist, but he wasn't dealing with these. He was dealing with, you know, adultery. Those, Tolstoy dealt with that as well on the Karenina, but in a much larger, huger kind of scale and all that. And, uh, and so th there was this radically overwhelming, overpowering sense of kind of religious significance in, in sort of the vision coming out of Russia at that time. Um, but Ilyin, Ilyin was a much more political thinker. And talking about Dostoevsky, his political views were rather along the lines of the Grand Inquisitor, if you know uh, the brothers Karamazov. And there's a section where um, Ivan has a dream. Uh, Ivan Karamazov, who's the atheist brother, who wants to give God the entrance ticket back uh, to the universe because he can't accept human suffering. Um, and he has a dream in which Jesus comes back during the Inquisition and he's arrested. And the Grand Inquisitor you know, speaks with him and he says, why are you coming back? You're talking about freedom again. You, didn't you get it the first time? People don't want freedom. They want bread. They want safety. They want circuses. Think of what we've done for everyone. The years, years we put into making them happy, trying to protect them from the great unknown. You've come back here. You just got to, you know, make, upset the apple cart again. So I'm sorry. We have to condemn you to death. Uh, so there's this vision where the people, they don't want the freedom. They don't want to confront the mysteries and anxieties that freedom, you know, uh, comes with. They want to be taken care of and treated like children. And Ilian had a vision like that, where he felt like it was, it was the responsibility of the few who were awakened to, to, to the truth of reality to be able to shepherd 
the many, until that time when the many were able to take on the burden themselves. So it was always that, yeah, we'll take power now for a brief period of time until you're able to do this, much like Lenin. He was a contemporary of Lenin. In fact, Lenin put Ilyin on one of the philosopher steamers. In 1922, there were two uh, steamers that were shipped out of uh, St. Petersburg. Um, and on them were you know, intelligentsia philosophers, you know, uh, uh, literary critics, psychologists, whatever, whom Lenin um, couldn't eradicate, but he couldn't let them stay in the country as well. Berdyaev was one of them, and Ilyin was another. And Ilyin wound up in Berlin and then in Switzerland, and he was a um, major figure in sort of the white Russian refugee communities in those places. And a, a series of articles, or essays he wrote in the 40s and the 50s um, were later republished in the 90s during this time, you know, after the, the collapse when, or perestroker and glass, and everything was kind of free and all this literature that hadn't been available, mostly religious, esoteric, spiritual, because the Soviets had banned all that. All that stuff was back um, and available again. Um, and there was one essay by Ilyin about what would happen to Russia with the collapse of the Soviet Union, because he always firmly believed that it would eventually collapse. And there were many white Russians who firmly believed it would not last, it was going to collapse. It took longer to then, um, actually there was a group called the Eurasianists who were putting together this whole vision, again, of Russia being this new civilization, and they were going to bring it right back uh, to, to the homeland once the Soviet experiment collapsed, but they died out before it did. But Ilyin's article predicted exactly what would happen. He said it, it would be the balkanization of Russia. So Soviet Union would collapse. The West would offer, you know, um, inducements to, you know, uh, self-determination and freedom and free market excess and democracy and all like that. And little by little, you know, the different states that had made up the Soviet Union would become independent. And there would only be Russia, which would be just a, 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 a truncated or dissected kind of country. Again, they have a mystical vision of Russia. It's not a country. It's not a nation. It's, 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 a, it's a kind of unity. It's like an organic entity that stretches across the great continent. And there's also the difference. One of the differences between the West and Russia is that the West thinks of me and the Russia thinks of we. The West has a me economy. And this is what Putin and Dugin and other uh, critics of the West and Russia point to, and they say, you have this economy that's all based on me, 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 the individual. What can I have? Well, you know, I can, and I, I can get any, I can buy reality if I want it now. I, I can do whatever I want with my money now. But in, in Russia, the whole idea is it's the we. It's like they're open arms, and it's the community, and it's not the individual. It's the organic whole and all that. And Ilyin had a kind of, he's called the Russian fascist in some way, because he did have this, again, this theocratic view of, of the church and the state coming together, and everyone would find their right place within that organic unity. And, you know, the, the elite, the, like the Grand Inquisitor, <laughs> up on the top level would, you know, shoulder the burden of shepherding everyone and making sure they're all happy and part of one big kind of family. So this is the sort of traditional values kind of vision that, that Putin talks about. I mean, whether he, does he really feel it? I, I, I don't know. I mean, who knows what's going on uh, in his head, but this is sort of the rhetoric uh, you can find in his speeches, you know, for the last, uh, the past several years. Hmm. Yeah, this is really fascinating because the, the picture that you're painting is like, it's kind of like the whole end of history idea or the end of the end of history idea that we thought that one particular worldview had had succeeded in the 90s. Francis Fukuyama famously wrote that book. Yeah. And what you're talking about are fundamentally different understandings of what a human being is, what society is, what culture is. Um, I had a conversation with um, a friend of mine who lives in Ukraine, and he said he'd lived in Russia, he lived in Ukraine, and he kind of said that Ukraine had a, had a real sense of the individual, a real orientation towards the West, and a, mm -hmm. a much more kind of recognizable understanding of, say, human rights or individualism. And he said that in Russia, he found that they didn't have that. And I kind of took that with a bit of a grain of salt because obviously he's, he's kind of, he's living in Ukraine. And, but his, his fundamental feeling was that Russia is, is unhappy with the compromises of freedom, unhappy with the compromises of individualism, and they've got a fundamentally different orientation. And you're kind of saying that that's, that's true. Well, that seems, again, that seems to be the case when you look, you look uh, throughout the history. Not to say that there haven't been 
elements and strains and very powerful ones that did want to, you know, be more individualized, let's say, uh, like the West, you know, starting with Peter the Great. Uh, but that created a fissure, you know, uh, in the Russian psyche um, uh, that's still op operative now, you know. But there, there does seem to be, I mean, people turn around and say, okay, we tried, you know, we had the 90s, you had, you had democracy, you had the free market, um, it was there, it was wonderful, we thought, Francis Fukuyama, it's the end of history, at least from Hegel's point of view, because now, you know, freedom is spread around the world. Well, freedom, at least in the sense of the free market, spread around the world. Um, but it didn't take. And again, this is something that a lot of Russians themselves say. Somehow it just doesn't, it doesn't work for us in some way. And uh, again, the, the left-leaning progressive Russians say, yes, that's the rhetoric they always say. That's the story they always say. But, you know, come on, come on. But actually, this is mystical rubbish. But for the others, they say, no, this is how it is. We're, we're, we, we are one people. It's not, it's, not, um, it's not a society in the sense of agreement among individuals to act in a certain way. We are you know, a, a brotherhood and in, 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 in great damp mother Russia. It's like great mother Russia and all that. It's the motherland. Um, and um, so, yeah, it, 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 it is radically different. And this... <laughs> One of the weird things, this is some of the ideas, one of the reasons I, uh, interesting thing in the book, or one of the things I point out in the book is that Putin is, is Ilian is one of these figures from what's called the Silver Age, um, sort of like 1890 up until just before the revolution, Berdyaev is as well, and, and, and Solovia. But that time was saturated with a lot of mystical, cosmic ideas as well. And there were a group of thinkers that emerged from that time who later became known as the Cosmists. And they've, they've become very, very popular again because many of their ideas link up with transhumanism, uh, overcoming death. I mean, uh, Fedorov, who was one of the early ones, um, uh, strange, strange, uh, Fyodor Fedorov, strange individual who, who believed that, you know, uh, the great central task that would unite all humanity would be to revive the dead. Right. And, uh, and not only the dead that are, happen to be dead recently among us, but those that are buried. And then we would have to create a space program because somehow the dead, ancestral dead, had gone up into space as dust in some way. How, how it left the planet, I don't know. How it got past the gravity, I don't know. But this is his vision. Uh, and gone back to the stars from which it had come in the first place. But we would have to invent space travel and the means to go and collect all that. And actually, that was a trigger for the actual Russian space program later on. Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who was one of um, Fedorov's um, students who sat at his feet and listened to this, actually invented <laughs> rocket engines and all that to be able to do that. And so it's strange. So they have this cosmic science fiction kind of vision of the world. And one of them, uh, Vladimir Vyrdnatsky, um, He's known as a, a geo, geo, geobiologist uh, in the sense that um, he studied how the Earth, how, how the presence of life on Earth actually changed the, 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 the planet itself. And he's actually one of the ones who first starts talking about the newosphere before Teja de Chardin and, and uh, contemporary people use it. Um, but he also believed that events on Earth were I should say, stimulated at least uh, by cosmic influences, you know, coming from the cosmic rays, from the stars and all this sort of thing. And, actually, and this is one of the ideas that this um, strange maverick uh, historian um, and ethnologist, uh, Lev Gumilev, I talked about earlier, he, he took that idea as well. And he said, as cosmic influences come down, and what they do, they, they stimulate something, this, this, this sort of stuff that is in human beings that he called passionarity. And it's... <laughs> It's something that, re and it's pure, this is purely biological, no mystical kind of stuff, it's purely chemical, biological, but it's something that reacts to these cosmic rays and it sort of stimulates people to go and, and you know, use their energies and go to, you know, enormous lengths and, and, to, and to endure suffering and all this, this kind of thing. And this is why people migrate and that's why wars happen and all this kind of thing. And the, and the notion is that, you know, we think wars happen and migrations and invasions because of secular things because of economics or political things. And I said, no, no, these <laughs> energies and, and influences, and not astrology, it's just like cosmic rays coming down, making us do this kind of thing. So in a certain way, I mean, 
you know, Putin could be saying, uh, you know, we Russians, we have this passionarity and we, we, ha we, we cannot be a little people, you know, held within our boundaries. It, it, they want Lebensraum in their, own, in their own sense in a certain way. And so, so there's a lot of, I guess from the West, they would call it cod science, but they have their own. These are people who are revered. You know, there's, there's universities named after them. There's, there's coins, there's money stamped after them. Um, and gradually more and more, they're becoming recognized as actual you know, scientists in the Western sense. But they have a completely different vision of, of human beings. It, it isn't the individual. It, it isn't the rational you know, individual of the Enlightenment. Um, we're, we're deeper connected to, more deeply connected to, the actual environment and influences coming around us, uh, and we, we don't, we're not even aware of, of how we're influenced by these things. So you mentioned that Ukraine is hugely important to, to the Russian psyche, the, the sort of... Well, to Putin, to Putin, certainly. Yeah. Putin's, Putin's psyche, certainly. I mean, he, he, he identifies with Vladimir I, who, who, who converted... He even says in his speeches, he, great Vladimir Juan, who, who you know, converted to the religion that has given our people our traditional values for you know, a thousand years now. So he identifies with him. That's why he had this huge statue. You know. hmm. So is there any truth to his assertions that Ukraine is, doesn't really exist and it's part of Russia? And... Well, how should we say? It's, in a way, it's kind of like saying, you know, somebody in the UK saying the, the colonies, you know, the, the American Western seaboard is, is still the colonies, you know, um, not quite. But no, I mean, in terms of history, I mean, oh, that's gone. The, the lost kingdom is lost. The golden age of Kievan Rus is gone. You know, uh, the Soviet Union's gone. You know, so uh, no, in terms of history, no, Ukraine's an independent country and it's, you know, established itself at that and um, you're invading it. But in the visions of the golden age of Russia, or Russian destiny, in that sense, um, for someone who accepted that, then they would say, oh, that's all, that's all just rubbish. That's, you know, in, uh, in the Ukraine is where we started, you know, we, we came. And um, I mean, as I said, he, he, Putin seems to really identify with Vladimir I, who, who um, converted the pagan Slavs to um, Christianity. Um, and that, again, you can say with Trump too, I mean, both of them are looking back to a golden age. Like Trump, it's more recent, it's you know, 1950s America. Um, but uh, with uh, Putin, it's, uh, I said, it's back when Russia was an empire. Russia's o only ever, it's, look at it this way, it was the Austrian-Hungarian empire, right? Um, Pre-World War I, and then there's just Austria <laughs> after that. So it was like, it's like that. You know, um, Russia suffered the fate that happened to Austria, the uh, Hungary Empire then, um, and ra it doesn't want to, or at least Putin doesn't want to accept that. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, where will this lead to? Um, I suspect he wants more than Ukraine. Will he get it? I don't know. So I did a couple of documentaries in Russia and. 2012 and then in 2015. And I remember at the time that the, the, the general uh, accepted wisdom then was that Putin was becoming more religious. He was kind of getting closer to the Orthodox Church. But the feeling was that that was a kind of strategic or an opportunistic thing rather than something that he truly believed. Do you think that it was an opportunistic thing? Do you think that he later sort of convinced himself of the kind of the the religious destiny of Russia, or do you think there's a kind of combination of the two? Well, I don't know. It's hard to know what's going on uh, behind those strange eyes of his. But in some ways, you could think of it as like a mafioso don, you know, who are very good Catholics. You know, they're very, very good Catholics and all that. And meanwhile, they have to take care of, you know, whoever uh, if he gets in the way. So, uh, so and again, the Russians, again, uh, this will sound cliched, and um, I'm, I'm sure Russian people might say, oh, this is just some more cliches about us. But they seem able to hold together contradictions in a way that Western or Anglo-Saxon or, you know, sort of uh, the other can't do. It's like, what? You know, the, it, 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 the mind boggles. Uh, but in the Russian soul, they're able to. And this is something that goes back to the early days of their uh, conversion, because um, many of the old pagan traditions and the pagan practices carried on alongside the new Christian ones. And so they had this thing they called double faith. 
Mm. So they're able to do both at the same time. But I mean, yeah, I mean, Putin's gone to, uh, he's done a pilgrimage to Mount Athos um, in Greece, which is um, home of the mystical side of uh, Russian Orthodoxy, with the Hesychists, uh, these monks who practiced uh, experiencing the inner light, this this kind of uh, sublime transcendent um, presence of, of the divine, and, and they carried that practice into Russia itself. And uh, Russia, in many ways, was colonized by the monks. It's it's a it's an example of a country or or an empire that was colonized through religion rather than, um, you know. Uh, uh, violence or aggression in the early days of Russia. I mean, because the monks went out into the forests, they're equivalent of the deserts, and they set up as hermits and then small little enclaves of monks, you know, gathered together, and then cities grew up around that and so on. So, uh, so again, religion was something that was absolutely central. And, um, the, uh, and he also uh, helped rebuild uh, the New Jerusalem Monastery uh, that was destroyed uh, during World War II. Uh, and he's visited other you know, religious sites and sacred sites. Uh, he has close ties with the church. Many of his ex-KGB friends and associates are now um, have a place within the hierarchy of the church as well. And there is a sense, where Putin himself has said that many times, that he's um, the upholder of traditional values against the decadent, you know, hyper-permissive, hyper-liberal West. This again ties in with this notion of um, Moscow being the third Rome I mean, there was the first Rome that fell to the barbarians, and then Byzantium, Constantinople, uh, fell in 1453 to the Turks. And at that point, that's when Moscow took on this mantle of being the third Rome. Uh, and there's all these connections with, um, uh, you know, the czarist Russia, well, czar means Caesar. In the first way, czarist Russia, the double-headed eagle, uh, Roman standards, and there's a variety of different legends and myths linking um, the, the Russian uh, people back back to the Romans and all that. And so, yeah, it's, it's again, it's funny when you think Russia, you think USSR, you think the Soviets, but that really was, uh, a, 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 as I said, an anomaly um, in their real life's blood. Mm. And how would you summarize that kind of animating worldview? People might be familiar with, with Alexander Dugin, who was kind of a very controversial thinker who... Yeah. It's talking effectively about a multipolar world and Russia having a unique destiny within that. So how would you summarize that kind of worldview? Well, I mean, <laughs> you talk about Russians having very strange uh, views. That's, you know, he's on the fringe of the fringe. Oh, actually, well, he's the center. It's the center fringe now. Again, this, you know, Velcroing together antithetical ideas is one of the things that um, Dugan does. I mean, uh, Dugan, uh, again, he's one of, had one of the strangest trajectories, I would say, in, in modern politics or even pop culture, because he's kind of, <laughs> or, or, or esoteric culture, he kind of um, straddles all of those things. But he started out as an anti-Soviet uh, punk, really. Uh, in the 80s, he got arrested for singing anti-Soviet songs and went to quite a bit of trouble. Um, and he had this remarkable career of, as I said, uh, starting out as anti-Soviet, then when the, the Soviet Union was collapsing, he realized he was a Soviet man, that he became you know, pro-Soviet. Um, uh, but he was able to weld together, he cherry-picked what was the good bits um, from totalitarian political uh, ideologies like uh, National Socialism, uh, uh, Mussolini's fascism, um, the Soviet, and, and so on. And put it together, and this is something he called the fourth political theory, because um, he's able to find much of value in, in all of those, um, again, totalitarian, you know, fascist, authoritarian regimes. But the evil of evils was uh, Western liberal democracy. And this was what had led the world into becoming a global marketplace. And he has a vision uh, of the ultimate war. Uh, the mother of all wars is between um, what he calls the Atlanticists, which is the maritime nations. Um, you know, they're, and they're, they're uh, mercantile and, and so on, all that. And then, but he, you know, the Eurasia. Eurasia is the mother of all continents. It's the largest single landmass on the planet. Um, but it's also the birthplace of a new civilization. Um, Dugan has what we... He takes from um, a German philosopher um, who was quite famous about 100 years ago named Oswald Spengler, who wrote a very popular book at the time called The Decline of the West. And basically, 
he argue, Spengler argues that um, history proceeds in organic kind of cycles. Civilizations are organisms. They, you know, they're born, they grow up, they reach a level of maturity, they you know, go into old age and they die. So there isn't a single linear kind of history you know, in which different civilizations you know, rise and fall within it. There are, it's like circular, different kinds of things. Um, and he considered the West, which I forget exactly when he saw the Western civilization starts, probably coming out with the Renaissance, I would think, is on its way out. Um, it's been in decline for some time, but it's sped up. And um, Dugan said, yes, that's the case. And what's happening in Eurasia is that Russia is going to come out of it, but not as it is now uh, a nation. And we have to remember, this is the only time in Russian history when it's not been an empire. The, you know, up until this collapse of the Soviet, there was a Russian empire of some form. This is the only time when it's only been a, a country or a nation like, like all others. Um, and this was something that Russia was always afraid was going to happen to Russia, that it was going to be cut up by the West and all that. And this was something that Dugan was afraid was going to happen. And um, so, but Russia is this new civilization that's coming out. So it's not just a new country, it's a completely new civilization, but it's all kind of way of seeing the world, its own kind of culture, its own notion of religion, its own sense of value and all that. And it's not the West, and it's based on what Putin calls traditional values. Um, Dugan would say that as well, but Dugan comes out of, um, or at least he's, he's, he's picked uh, and, and uh, taken from a school of esoteric thought known as traditionalism. Um, which we can think of as a kind of fundamentalist esotericism, um, which says there's like one fundamental true tradition that was, you know, given to mankind in ages past, and that was the golden age. And ever since then, we've fallen away from that into deeper and deeper dismay and disarray and so on. And now we're in the Kali Yuga in the Hindu tradition, or the Iron Age in, in the Greek one. Um, and uh, there are some traditionalists who say, let us, let, let us just stand on the sidelines and watch the West fall. It will. It's on its way. It's inevitable. And there's others who want to get in there and help it uh, down. Um, and Dugan's one of those. Or at least, well, yeah, he's actually, you know, he's, he's, he's actually been on, on the lines and, you know, firing weapons and things of that sort. And, uh, um, uh, but, you know, it's like the, it, the West has to come down. And so he does anticipate some final, you know, you know, uh, smash, bang, you know, c catastrophic, uh, you know, battle between these two sides. And one has to say, you know, you have Russia on one side here and NATO, you know, talk about Atlanticists. Uh, not exactly NATO, I mean, because we have poor Ukraine um, in between, but that's, that's, the, that's the land they're, they're battling over. Mm. And you mentioned how a lot of the sort of ideas that come from this sort of trajectory create sort of cultish dynamics. Um, my question is whether there's a kind of a cult around Putin right now. I mean, by definition, if someone's in power for 20 years, then you get surrounded by yes men, you get surrounded by echo chambers, you kind of become a little bit more detached from reality. Because what's interesting is that pretty much most of the Russia experts thought that he wouldn't invade Ukraine. They thought that it was, he didn't have enough troops to hold it. They thought that it would be, it would have um, really negative effects domestically for Russia, that it would be a, ne it would be a bad idea for him mm. to do it. And they kind of decided he probably wouldn't do it. He obviously did, but there's an open question as to whether it was a kind of big gamble that may have gone wrong. This is an open question, we don't know. We're only a few days into the, the conflict. Mm. But, but what I wonder is if he's animated by this kind of, this, this religious driver, that does mm. sometimes make us lose touch with reality. And so, yeah, I wonder if that's the kind of, did, well, a good question is, did you expect him to invade, knowing what you do about these, these kind of drivers, or did you think that maybe he, he might be bluffing? I, I was surprised, actually, when I woke up and saw that, you know, um, you know he actually invaded Ukraine and there were bombs. I, I thought he would go and occupy the already breakaway, you know, areas and focus on that somehow and put more pressure uh, on Zelensky and try to oust him from within. Um, because, you know, he was making these speeches, you know, Ukrainian people put down your <laughs> weapons and don't listen to the Nazis and, you know, and apparently Zelensky is a Jewish Nazi, which is a tough one. Uh, <laughs> not to say the word, but uh, so, um, yeah, I know. I, but then again, this is the thing. He's inscrutable. Or is he just mad? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, 
you, you, as you say, the people in power, they tend to get a circle around them and they're cut off in a way from um, any other influence coming to them. And apparently Putin has been very uh, paranoid about COVID. So everyone's really been kept at a distance, literally, and all that. And um, I mean, the thing I always think is he has to be thinking about who is going to take his place because he, he, that's how he got picked. Who, who's going to protect Yeltsin? Okay, he'll make sure, you know, whatever. So who's going to protect him? And I don't know. I don't know enough about the in, inner world of the, the politics there, but um, does he have friends? You know, are there people waiting for him to slip up or something? Um, I heard some people, you know, there's some things you see on, on posts saying about how this might be the opportunity for more and more, you know, the Russian people um, to, you know, step up and all that. But I, I don't know, there's already several thousand of them arrested. So, he, I, I, you know, it, it, my backseat psychology, just, you know, thinking what might be, think, he probably thought it'd be over in a couple of days, shock and awe. And it, it isn't. And um, no, I mean, he's, it's Zelensky, he's, he's inspiring. I mean, he's, he's, he's you know, he, was, he played a president uh, as an actor and now he's, he's fitted for the role. He's, he's, he's stepped up to the plate, you know, um, uh, no, good for him. Mm. Yeah. And just a sort of detour into Zelensky, because we mentioned it just before we started recording. It's a fascinating parallel of Trump, like the reality TV star who becomes president. But with Zelensky, you've got someone who played the president on TV. He is clearly someone who's who's stepping up to the mark mm. in this environment. Like he's he's a genuinely inspiring figure. He's kind of I don't need a ride. I need ammo. When he's offered a offered a way absolute, out. Absolutely, that that's going to go down. You know, in the history, that's you're going to find out in quotes. You know, upon Google and all that. No, that's remarkable. Good for him. Yeah, and so I guess my my question is whether this might be a driving a driving force. These these kind of ideas and. For, for Putin and for the people around him, but I wonder how much traction they have. And there, there then you've got this kind of religious driver within Russia, but it's then meeting this also, like the, the force of freedom, the force of independence, the force of self-determination in Ukraine is another deep religious driver. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that whole area has been fought over uh, again for centuries. Um, Poland uh, had part of it. There was Western Ukraine that was sort of controlled by Poland, the, uh, Lithuania had parts of it, Russia had parts of it. And so it was fought over back and forth many, many times. There was even, I mean, there was a compromise between um, uh, Roman Catholicism and Greek Orthodox called the Uniate Church because the, 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 there were battles between the, the Roman Catholics coming and, and the Greek Orthodox fighting them off and all that. So, I mean, I saw somewhere on, on, on some news report where uh, Putin had said that Ukraine was invented by Lenin or something, but this is just rhetoric. I mean, it goes, you know, um, maybe it's a separate independent nation because it was, it's, it was like an area. I mean, it used to be, is it Ukraine or the Ukraine? So like the Ukraine, and it, I mean, it was the, I remember it being called the breadbasket of Europe. I remember uh, history class, Hitler wanted to get at it because this was the, you know, the wheat fields and all this, this was, you know, the geopolitics. Um, so, no, it has its own history. And again, it's always been, again, there's Russia, but there's like, again, the, the czar, he's the gathering in of all the Russias. So there's Russia, then there's white Russia, and then there's little Russia. So it's been Russia, but they've kind of had separate kind of entities or identities or something like that. Um, but overarching, you know, the, the, the czar, you know, the little father uh, looking over everyone like that. And I guess Ukraine's grown up, you know, <laughs> doesn't want the little father anymore. And I suspect the other countries nearby don't, don't want it either. But the vision, you know, Dugan's vision is there would be a, you know, authoritarian traditionalist state from Vladivostok to Dublin, you know, across the whole, I mean, this is the, you know, the, the future battle between the Atlanticists and, and the, um, the Eurasianists. So by definition, that is an expansionist yes, project. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes, yes, yeah. Mm. And he sees Moscow as being the center of that empire? Well, Russia, yeah, Russia it takes the lead um, in that. And but alliances with other, you know, uh, China, you know, um, Turkey. I mean, I, I don't know, according to his, his vision and all that. And um, um, I mean, but... I mean, remember the alt-right? They're not around anymore. I don't hear about them anymore. But they were quite taken uh, uh, with Dugan. 
mm. um, and this this kind of vision as well. Because I, the thing is, like, if you hate the West, you know, enough, almost anything seems like uh, a viable alternative. So I mean, I, I you know, we all know there's problems uh, with that and all that, but it seems so much of it is is driven by this kind of rancor and 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 vehemist, vehemistic hate. You know, it's a. And you mentioned that the Soviet era, obviously, a lot of these ideas went underground, a lot of these thinkers were sent abroad. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there, because the Soviet era was completely secular and was sort of crushing a lot of the, mm -hmm. the mystical strains in the Russian culture, that in a way they were bound to come back with a vengeance once the Soviet era was gone? Yeah, I mean, it's something, yeah, you, you, can't, you can't keep that down, especially, I would say, in the Russian people. And, you know, it was kept alive in many ways, as you say, underground. Um, and even within the Soviet culture itself, a lot of these mystical, you know, uh, we, we know the Soviets are very interested in, in, in paranormal and were investigating these sorts of things. There were even um, expeditions in the 20s uh, sent to Tibet uh, in the notion that <laughs> attempts to combine variants of Tibetan Buddhism uh, with also the belief that the Tibetans had possessed some kind of super science. Um, that was hidden away, and that they would be able to, they would share that. Uh, and then there was attempts to create a kind of pan-Buddhist communist state and all that. So it's, you know, on the front, you know, the, 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 uh, the surface, it's all secular and it's all rational and that kind of thing. Um, but underneath, um, the, this, this stuff was still, still going on, you know. Uh, and yes, it just it finally, you know, you can't keep it. But just like in the West, even though in the West, you know, um, it's not banned. You can go, you know, to your New Age bookshop and get anything you want. Mystical, it's still kind of poo-pooed and considered to be kind of rubbish. Um, and, you know, the intelligentsia here always say, oh, it's finally been debunked and none of this stuff means anything anymore. But that, it doesn't go away either because it's part, it's part, of, our, it's part of our being, it's part of our psyche. I, I just would say in, in, in Russia, except for that short you know, period when the Soviets were in power, it was something that was more prominent um, than in the West, because the West, you know, bases itself on, on, on logic and science and rationality. And that never quite went over as well over in Russia as, as it did in the, in the enlightened West. Mm. And you mentioned Russia's destiny. What do you think that Putin and the people around him think is Russia's destiny? Well, if he's listening to people like Dugan, um, certainly it's at least to regain what they call the near abroad, which were the countries that, you know, had belonged to the Soviet Union, so Ukraine and the others. So this, this was, you know, it's, they're foreign lands now, but they, they used to not be. Um, and I would guess it's to destabilize Europe, destabilize NATO. You know, this was um, something that, um, yeah, I understand this is what Dugan is saying, it needs to do. I mean, the West needs to be brought down. Um, because what the West wants to do is turn the world into a gigantic global marketplace, you know, so where you can buy everything. And um, I mean, how much, does, I don't know, does Dugan really believe in these traditional values? Does Putin really, really believe in them? Is it, as you say, just a tactic, a strategy? It's, it's hard to say, but that's sort of the identity, you know. What other identity does Russia have? It doesn't have an identity. This is the thing. With the collapse of the Soviets, it didn't have an identity anymore. We're not Marxists anymore. We're not communists. What are we? You know, and the, we're not Westerners. We, we, some of us want to be, but we really, it doesn't quite, you know, in a way, it's not quite the same. But once again, as with the, the Bolshevik Revolution, when all the Russian aristocracy, you know, fled to Europe and you had Counts, counts and countesses, you know, working in, 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 in grocery shops or wherever. You know, it's a fallen aristocracy, not quite the same way, but it's like, well, we used to be this, but we don't quite know who we are. We don't know where we fit in anymore. And I think that's what would happen to Russia. And Putin gave them something, some sense of identity. So I don't know. I mean, it was good for them, and say in the sense, um, and what I understand is the average Russian, again, this mystical creature, um, has a higher living standard than had, had been before, although I don't know, you know, in recent times of the economy there. But I guess that's the problem. You know, what, is, what does it mean to be Russian, you know, if, if, you, if you no longer have this past that you, you know, you used, to, used to give you an identity? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the interesting thing for me, I guess, is that often, and I, I did a couple of films as well about Islamic radicalism mm. and an uh, amazing book called Terror and Liberalism by Paul Berman, I don't know if you're familiar yeah, with. He, his, his kind of overall theory is that the compromises of liberalism will always create terror uh, because or extremism because people are uncomfortable with it so they want certainty and that will manifest as all of these different forms of like Islamic extremism or but the, the common the common theme was uncertainty creates discomfort in some people who will then go to kind of certainty and extremism in exchange and in a way you could kind of see Russia as a kind of extremist state in that context but what I found interesting is reading that book he talks about Saeed Qubd and a book that he wrote called In the Shade of the Quran. Mm. He was in America in the 1950s. He wrote about kind of the, um, I guess, the moral degradation of America or the... And what I find interesting is that often the critiques, like Putin's critique of the West or Saeed Qub's critique of the West, will have some validity. Mm -hmm. Like in the West, we know the, the price of everything, the value of nothing. We've got a very kind of shallow view of what human beings are we're kind of incredibly rationalist and we've stripped out a lot of the kind of deeper threads of the soul and all of this stuff like th there's a lot of truth in the critiques but then the solution an islamic caliphate yeah. for the world or a russian empire are like like the solutions don't make sense yeah. they're not they're not equipped for the the modern age yeah. But, it, but I find it fascinating how there is almost always like a, a degree of truth in the critiques of the West. Well, that's why um, many intelligent people find, um, well, uh, stuff of value in Dugan or in uh, one of his uh, intellectual heroes, Julius Evola, who was um, an Italian um, esoteric thinker in the 20th century who had far right, very far right, where he cozied up to National Socialists and to uh, uh, Mussolini's um, fascists as well. And, um, you know, in some ways you can just, oh, he's a frothing fascist and all that. But if you bother to read him, he's intelligent. His, his criticisms, you know, are very sharp. Um, so you can't just, you know, if you're intelligent and sensitive and uh, have any intellectual integrity, you can't just, you know, it doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but you can see, yes, those, those arguments are there. We, we, the West is under what um, uh, uh, Gainon, Rene Gainon, uh, who was sort of the founder of traditionalism, called the reign of quantity. You know, as you say, we have the price of everything and the value of nothing. Uh, and this, this all has historical precedence. You know, I mean, um, it, it, uh, how should we say it? You know, uh, the, the West was about giving social, economic freedom or, you know, capacity for you to pursue your happiness. But it doesn't give you any particular idea what that happiness might be. Um, it assumes, you know, another car or a bigger TV screen or something like that. But, you know, maybe back in the 50s when all that's kind of started, that, yeah, people had, you know, rather, you know, limited lives then and then suddenly, ooh, we had all this great stuff. So maybe initially it was. But then, as I said, you know, it comes down to that question of freedom. What, what do you do with your freedom? You know, what do you do? And people, you're right. People, many of us don't want that. But the answer isn't to go, isn't to agree with the Grand Inquisitor. But nobody likes the other answer is to you know, uh, shoulder the burden of your freedom individually. And that's, that's pretty tough to do um, because it is just you. Um, and, and it's not only religion. I mean, people identify, you know, uh, it's, it's this tribal sense we have now. Um, you know, it's, it's gender, it's sex, it's race, um, whatever. It's all these different, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. And um, we really focus much more on a kind of plurality, you know, he's saying Dugan's notion of a multipolar world. Um, but I, I always thought you can only have, you can only have two poles. I mean, you could have quite a few of them at <laughs> times, but you can only have two that are connected to each other. Um, but, you know, it's a sense of um, these smaller and smaller units being what, you know, really constitutes your connection to things, not these larger kind of visions of unity and, and stuff like that. And I, I, in a way, there's a kind of romanticism in a way, uh, in the sense of how romanticism appeared politically in the late 18th or early uh, 19th century uh, about the, the, the folk, the people, not, not the state, not society, but, you know, this is where we get folk music from and folk arts and all that. So it's, it's like that. It's a, 
good in that sense, but then it also, it, it, it can lead to just this kind of fracturing of everything. And it's, I, I say in the uh, Dark Star Rising, I, I feel like we've entered this period of the war of all against all, you know, go back to Hobbes in the sense where all these different groups are fighting each other. They're fighting for respect. They want this, want that. Or each of us individually are competing with everybody else on the internet for likes and, you know, people to like your posts and read your posts and all that kind of thing. So there is this, so that, that Russian sense of whether it's real or not of the we, the kind of, you know, um, the unity of brotherhood can be appealing to the people that are tired of all this, you know, individual, you know, um, freedom where you have the freedom to choose, but you don't have any criteria w w w by which you make your choices. Mm. And you also mention the kind of, I mean, you've got apocalypse in, mm. the, in mm. the title of your book, which is... And you mentioned kind of the apocalyptic strain within Russian thinking, which is a kind of terrifying thing to, to think That's, about, yeah. especially now is, Putin has just put the Russian nuclear arsenal on, on high alert. And I guess this is the, the terrifying prospect for the world, which is someone like that, who potentially humiliation could feel like a fate worse than death for has the power of nuclear weapons. Mm. Well, when I first saw it, you know, on the watching BBC News in the bottom, breaking, you know, <laughs> Putin, you know, um, puts nuclear, you know, forces on high alert. I, I did say what, you know, um, because he said we're, you know, we had we had uh, climate change, COVID, and we got war, and quite a few other things happening at the same time too. And it does seem to be, you know, again, one doesn't want to be alarmist and uh, yeah, all that, but at the same time, it does seem to be quite a collection of crises all, you know, happening at the awesome. same time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I didn't even look, think of it that, that, that way, but hmm, somebody probably is. Someone's writing, writing that book now. Um, I don't know. I mean, would he go that limit? I'd like to think he wouldn't, but I, I think what's perhaps more, you know, worrying is that um, possibility of something happening, you know, uh, all these forces in play. Uh, what if a Russian jet strays into NATO zone somehow and or whatever, you know, and one thing leads to the other, you know, so one hopes that uh, uh, one also hopes that there are people on his um, on his staff that um, uh, more rational than that. In your book, you kind of summarize, a, you call it a third way, which is a sort of integration of some of the ideas, some of the kind of a healthy integration of some of the more kind of yeah. mystical spiritual trends within Russian thought with with the West. Yeah. Can you spell out? What well, this this was like? this was the sort of the sadness of the tragedy. One of the sa sa tragedies of of the Bolshevik Revolution is that uh, I mentioned this time the Silver Age, when some of these thinkers um, uh, were active, and fundamentally they were trying to compensate for what seemed to be the West's loss of soul, the, the West's pragmatic, utilitarian, you know, the greatest happiness of the greatest good, everything seen in terms of quantity. Um, the West had somehow, not everyone, obviously, there were poets and thinkers and writers and musicians who, you know, you know believed in all that and, and, and tried to express it. But in general, the West's point of view was not that way, uh, increasingly secular, increasingly economic. Um, and they thought that that would eventually lead to, you know, you know, uh, that was bad. That would, that, would, that, would, that would lead to sort of the end, end of the culture and end, end, end of the, the, the civilization. And it needed to bring back into it this kind of more mystical, religious, spiritual sense that the Russian people, the Christ-bearing people, you know, they were, they were known, you know, they were the Christ-loving people that they had. This was this universalism, you know, in that sense. They, they become the chosen people in the way, say, like the Jews had been the chosen people in, in, in uh, earlier time. Uh, and, but again, this is the best vision of them. And obviously, you know, there's political connotations to that. And critics in the West said this is just the front for this Russian expansionism and Russian exceptionalism and all that. It has a unique destiny and so on and so on. Uh, but the central idea was to blend kind of that, that mystical visionary sense. And not only mystical visionary, but it was a sense that dealt with the, the quality of things. It was geared toward a life filled not only with quantity, but things of value. And how do you, how do you gauge those values? You can't, you can't quantify those kind of values. Beauty will save the world. 
This is again a fundamental you know, thing like that. And, and, um, and so the idea was to bring this together and that would somehow create a third way, a, a, a way that was something more than you know, the mystical East or the mis mystical Russia and you know, the um, you know, uh, pragmatic utilitarian uh, West. And this was something people like Rudolf Steiner and um, Hermann Hesse and, as I said, Oswald Spengler and other thinkers at the time, they, they thought this new culture would be rising out, there would be a blend of that happen, coming. And then bang, you know, the Bolsheviks came in and kind of just shut that all down. And so, although... One, and in one, a way, one, the Bolsheviks was the imposition of a very Western European idea on the oh, Russians. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and fundamentally driven by the same vision of the West in the sense that human beings, there's no such thing as a soul. Uh, we are tabula rasa, blank slates, the environment, 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 environment. It's, it's nurture, nurture, nurture. Forget about nature. We're born a blank slate. And it's, if we create the right environment, we will create the right citizen. You know, you know, it's B.F. Skinner <laughs> said the same thing later on. Um, and in, in the West, it was, um, you know, John Locke who said, you know, there's no such thing as divine right of kings because we're all born tabula rasa. Um, there's nothing in the mind that didn't get there by way of the senses. The spirit, no, we were born with the soul. And contemporary, I mean, uh, you know, Jungian archetypes, you know, they, they didn't get there by way of the senses. They're, they're there. They're, 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 it's rather, you know, I, I always think of it this way, you know, for this... Tabula rasa vision is like we're, we're, we're all like an empty flat and we have to go to Ikea and buy a bunch of stuff and bring it back, then your flat's furnished. Whereas the other guys, no, you have a furnished home already, you know, it's there, you know, and you learn where, where, where things are. Any case, um, that same vision, Lenin's vision was the same as the vision of the West, except he took it in this, you know, communist way rather than in, in the, the capitalist way. But the first thing he had to eradicate was the sense of an interior life. That's what he said. The very first thing is eradicate this notion that there's an inner life. And that's how he had to get rid of anything that was religious, anything spiritual, anything like that. Um, yeah. So that was... And it wasn't, how should we say it? Um, it wasn't one religion persecuting another religion, which you had in the past. It was an atheist, you know, scientific rationalist um, view um, trying to annihilate religion. So it was a very, very difficult kind of thing, you know, uh, very, very different, difficult to do, but uh, 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 a different sort of thing than one religion persecuting another. And um, yeah, and then I like said, what was it, 70 years it lasted, something like that, 80 years? Um, as soon as the, the lid, you know, came off a bit, all that popped out again. And, um, people, uh, you know, the Theosophical Society suddenly became, you know, very popular again. Rudolf Steiner's work became very popular and all these homegrown, and even today there are homegrown, you know, new pagan movements in, in Russia and, and sort of new mystical teachers and all this sort of thing. The Cosmists are, you know, once again, uh, very popular. Um, so yeah, I said they, in a way, they, they've plunged back in head first, you know, into something that had been kind of, you know, kept uh, away from them for a long time. Mm. And we're now seeing it expand beyond the bounds of Russia. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, again, it, it, you, you can say, like, what happened, you know, um, when the barbarians invaded the capital, it's not quite the same thing, but it's another sort of expression of the id or the unconscious or the repressed or something like that, you know. Um, and it wasn't... I mean, that, this tangentially, but the first thing I thought of when I saw the news reports of that was the 1967 anti-war, anti-Vietnam War march, um, where, you know, uh, people like Kenneth Anger and, and, uh, and others were, were trying to exercise the, the Pentagon. They wanted to encircle it. And, but it both, they both had this kind of weird, irrational kind of character to it. it you know, it wasn't just like a, a protest march or something. It was this weird kind of breakdown of everything. Um, so, I mean, in general, in general, I, I, I think uh, what, what we're seeing, well, I think in general what we're seeing are the results of the fact that we haven't yet integrated these two sides of ourselves. Yeah. Individually, some of us may have, um, but that's the hope down the line, more, more will. But as cultures or, or civilizations, we haven't been able to do it. And there'll still be, you know, a lot of turbulence until, until that happens. This 
seems a little bit like or reminiscent of Ian McGilchrist's work. The idea of the left brain and the right brain and the very rationalist left brain versus the more holistic kind of spiritually oriented contextual right brain and you're kind of saying that these these two fundamental forces are at work in yeah, yeah. the split between Russia and yes. the West. Yeah, yeah, yes, very much so. I mean, that's on a global scale. I mean, um, Steiner, just speaking of him, because he, he, I begin the book uh, with an account of um, a series of lectures Steiner gave in 1906 in Paris. He was originally supposed to uh, lecture in, in Russia, but the 1905 revolution, or failed revolution, um, prevented that. But many Russians came because Steiner was one who had this vision of this new culture, this, this new, what was it, the, the sixth post-Atlantean culture emerging from, from the bosom of Russia. And this would be this new step in, in mankind's evolution. Um, so he, and he, but he believed that uh, Central Europe was a kind of midway point between the two, the two sides. And so uh, he had this vision of different races and different cultures and civilization having different kind of you know, tasks uh, in terms of evolution. Uh, a consciousness of 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 of, of uh, the human race. Um, so he did see that, yeah, there was a possibility of this emerging um, out of out of that. And yeah, I mean, I mean, McGilfus' work is, is is very important. And one of the most important things that he's done is he's anchored something that you can see it in our history, you know, and you can see it in the culture and, and in literature and philosophy. And that's one of the things that did it for me when I read the fir his first book, Master and His Emissary. I haven't got on to the, the newer one yet. Um, was that, yes, okay, now, yes. Now I, how he was explaining the ways that cerebral hemispheres worked, I could see how this would be reflected in these different kind of clashes or, or tensions of uh, polar opposites, you know, throughout history and all that. Um, and, uh, I mean, whether whether these ways of seeing the world or being in it are, you know, absolutely anchored in, in that part of our anatomy or not, in one sense doesn't matter, but we can recognize that there are these very, very radically two different ways of dealing with the world. And um, the way associated with the left, uh, and I mean the left brain, um, is it's practical, it's utilitarian. And we still tend to give that the benefit of the doubt, because we don't know what to make of the other, you know, the right brain or the soul. As I say, I'm not saying the soul is in the right brain, but the, the way the way these Russian writers describe their experiences of, you know, this way of knowing the world through the soul is very much along the lines of what uh, uh, McRilkis describes how the right brain sees it as holistic, it sees it, it, its immediacy, its its isness. I mean, the way I, I talk about it, so left brain it takes care of business and the right brain takes care of isness. And it's just the sheer istikkeit, as the German um, mystical um, teacher, Meister Eckhart, would say, the isness of things, just the fact that they exist. And we, I mean, this sounds like philosophy 101, but we lose track of the, of the fact that the, the fact that anything exists at all is mystical to begin with. I mean, forget about science sending whatever out into the nearest black hole. The most mysterious things in the universe are ourselves. Um, and you know, we're, we're the ones who make the universe mysterious, because without us, it'd just be a bunch of gas and heat and stuff like that. So uh, why are we here? You know, science can't tell us that. Well, we're here because less than nothing exploded for no reason 15 billion years ago. Well, this may be how I got here, but that's not why I'm here. But, you know, the other side is ask those questions, you know, and we reserve, you know, we, have, we give lip service to that, okay, you can go meditate, or that, but we don't really take it seriously in the sense that th that should really stop us in our tracks and recognize that seeing everything in terms of practical, utilitarian, evolutionarily adaptive strategies um, just cuts out everything that makes life worth living. Mm -hmm. Yeah, give me one miracle, and then I'll explain the where the rest, as the scientific worldview says. Well, yeah, fundamentally, you know, I mean, Stephen Hawking, uh, what the universe came into being because of a, a quantum fluctuation in a pre-existing vacuum. That just sounds like it happened, you know, and we knew that already, you know. So I'd much prefer some of the ancient myths, you know, their their stories about it because it gives a kind of narrative, you know. Gary, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. And if you'd like to join conversations like this, check out our digital campfire.
You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes, and you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below, and we'd love to see you soon.